Seb, can you make me co-host? Let's see if that works that way. Wait, uh, it I might did. be going. It says live, so we're good to go. There's about 56 different questions that we're trying to answer at our research farm and then deliver that information to the farming community. We know improving the quality of the soil will help farmers build resiliency on their farm. When the weather is as erratic as it is, this is the only buffer that you have against that weather. Hi, my name is James from Barn to Door. We help thousands of farmers across the country increase sales and save time online. Join me for today's session, 2021 Trends Every Farmer Needs to Know, where we're going to cover the tips and tactics that your farm can employ to build a thriving business online. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Hello and welcome. My name is Lauren and I'm the program director. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry that was not planned. All right. Sorry for that. Um, thanks so much for joining us here at the conference. We are doing the Grazers, Beginning Grazers 101 uh, with Adam Abel from NRCS. So he's going to go ahead and, and give his presentation. We do have a chat screen, so you can go ahead and add in any questions that you have for him. We're going to do our best to get those answered um, on the fly here as we go. So I'll hand it over to Adam. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Abel. I'm a soil con with the NRCS. Uh, before we jump into this, I was going to uh, tell you a little bit about me and how I got into grazing. Uh, because it has some relevance to what we're talking about here right now. Uh, my family got into rotational grazing when I was eight years old. My dad went into rotational grazing, kicking and screaming. It wasn't something that he wanted to do. Uh, we had stray voltage on our farm and we were losing animals and it was a real problem. So he just kicked them out 
and uh, they were basically on two big dry lots for uh, a number of years when I was really young. And then uh, the first grazing conference in 1988 happened uh, in Medford, or actually Stetsonville, just south of Medford. My dad went to that. I was eight years old, and that's when we started grazing, and we've been grazing ever since. Uh, I grew up uh, milking cows on a, a grazing grass-based dairy. It wasn't complete 100% grass. It was uh, probably 50% of their diet in the summertime was pasture and the other 50% was store feed. And then in the wintertime was a very conventional operation. We've since transitioned from that to a stocker operation or to a beef operation to a stocker operation. And now my dad is grass finishing beef on pastures. So that's my story. That's how we got started into rotational grazing. I have been doing this since I've been eight years old. So I know that any eight year old out there can do this. It's that simple if you set this up right. And that's the real advantage that I wanna stress with all of this. We can talk about all these structural things, the fencing, the water lines, the lanes, um, all that that is a physical thing that's easy to see. But if you take nothing away from this uh, presentation, I want you to understand that you have to think about the type of animal you have how you want them to rotate. So that way you're working with the way they move. Think about the animal husbandry that is involved with that. And then also think about how you wanna manage that site so that way you don't corner yourself into such a situation that I'm only grazing or I'm only cropping this. Think about it as a whole system, your entire farm. And that's been a very good way to start. Now I'm not saying that works for everybody, but it is something that I want people to consider because it doesn't pigeonhole you into one slot or another slot. And those are very big things that I start conversations with, with people on. The other thing that I wanna say before we jump into this conversation, I've set this up in such a way that um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of the practices that NRCS helps producers cost share on. So we're going to be talking about fencing, pipelines, lanes, and I'm going to be talking about them from our standards and what we would need if we were going to provide cost sharing for that. So, uh, I tell everybody this that gets into grazing. If you do want to graze, you should absolutely contact your local NRCS office and talk to them because the experience that we can bring to the table is really beneficial. And just because someone says that we're from the NRCS and we've got to do this, that doesn't mean that you need to take our ideas and this is what it's got to be. What I found is that bringing someone who's got some grazing experience together with your property and you can kind of meld those ideas, it'll get you thinking about. Um, different concepts, maybe different layouts that you didn't even consider. And paper's cheap, you can sketch out all these different layouts and lanes and whatever you want. And hopefully the end result is better than what anybody could have done by themselves. I'm a big fan of active participation when you're setting these systems up because we're talking about long-term management systems. And if we can get that right or close to right from the get-go, that's gonna save everyone a bunch of time. So. I'm going to start sharing my screen now for this presentation and uh, jump into it. So this is beginning grazer 101. So this is a big topic because there is a lot to cover with the beginning grazing operation. Uh, so I'm going to approach it from the standpoint as if we were working together and you're going to start from the get-go. The one thing, though, that I want to point out here is that you're going to find out as you go into rotational grazing that the things that are important to you in the beginning become less important towards the end. And remember that. Think about that as you go through setting your operation up into rotational grazing over the course of the next three years, six years, and then beyond. Because everybody that starts rotational grazing, their main concerns are, seed, fence, water, lanes, do I need them? All these big structural things, right? After you start grazing, what's really interesting is watching this, this whole dynamic and concept evolve. You find out that grass and rest and residual and starting to understand that your farm, you're a grass farmer, not a beef farmer, not a dairy farmer. The more grass you can produce means the more money you produce because your cows are producing better. And that's something that if you start to recognize that sooner, you're gonna springboard yourself ahead and you'll become a better grazer. You'll become a better environmentalist, a better uh, organic producer. And that being said, I should mention that I'm approaching this from the grazing standpoint. All these can be applied to organic operations or non-organic operations. So while my presentation isn't 
I know that Moses is organic. This is this is not exclusive to one or the other. So, so beginning grazer 101. My name is Adam Abel. I'm a soil conservationist from the Northeast area. I get to play around with farmers all the time. My job pays me to go outside and have fun. I can't complain. Um, I have had the opportunity to work with hundreds of grazers, and I'm going to stress this again: if you are looking for help to get set up in rotational grazing reach out to somebody who's successfully done that. Reach out to your local ag agent or your local NRCS office so that way you can get started up and start those faces from the get-go and get them pointed in the right direction. So one of my favorite quotes, and this is true, and I can't stress this enough when it comes to rotational grazing. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. And this is a very important thing because we are talking about mindset with grazing. And that really is a concept that I want people to understand and think about. You go into rotational grazing with the concept that this is going to fail. You're gonna fail. I mean, it's not like we're trying to, you know, you gotta go forward thinking this absolutely works. And the really great thing about this, we know this works. We know through UW research, we know through farmer input, we know through different lending uh, communities or uh, institutions, we've got the data that proves that this not only works, but this is an excellent way to promote agriculture in Wisconsin, whether it's dairy, whether it's stockers, whether it's beef, grass fed, cow calf operations. You look at the numbers on this, not only does grazing compete most of the time in most situations, it actually excels. Now, where people get hung up on this a lot of times is that they think, they're, they're getting um, net profit versus gross, gross profit mixed up. So, uh, you know, if you've got a conventional dairy that's selling thousands and thousands of pounds of milk versus uh, a grass-based dairy that's looking at 60 pounds a day versus 100 pounds a day, the difference is you think, oh, more milk means more money. But the reality is you've got to think about this from the standpoint of what am I actually keeping? What's my net profit? And those are real concepts that you have to embrace if you want to be successful in today's agricultural economy. And grazing is one way to do that. So the reason I say that right away is because I've gotten really good because I've dived into the numbers on this. I don't want people to uh, think that grazing is the only way to farm. There's a lot of different ways to do this, but this is absolutely one way to farm. It's straight up production agriculture, whether it's organic production, whether it's grass-based production, or whether you're just a regular guy that wants to, hey, I wanna have a better impact on the environment, or just as simple as I wanna make more money. Look at those. So understanding your money and coming into this with a successful mindset is gonna spring you ahead. So how to set up a successful grazing system. This is what I was getting at from the get-go. You gotta think about how you want this to look so that way you don't cause yourself trouble. Simple things like gates and pipelines and interior fences, you know, if you put them in the wrong situation or put them in the wrong corner or uh, don't design that so there's flow, you can really make this a difficult thing to manage and it doesn't have to be. So a little bit of thought, a bunch of scratch paper, taking a look at a soils map, a production map, and you can really get some fine data and fine tooth or um, uh, point your direction. You know, you can get the soils that produce the same in different pastures. You can get the sensitive areas that are gonna be wet in May, get those out of there. You can set this up so you can still uh, harvest hay off of it all year long. You don't have to be one or the other. That flexibility is going to allow you to be productive. That also helps you set these successful systems up. So to start with proper layout, with uh, consideration to animal husbandry. We've already touched on that a little bit, but this is really uh, the biggest thing that I see people screw up on from the get-go. You know, you can hire a fencing contractor and they'll build your fence just the way you want it. They'll put the pipeline in, you got an excavator out there, the lanes, like those aren't the things that are problematic when it comes to the first initial steps of setting up a grazing operation. The first thing is to just think about how cows flow how animals flow, even simple concepts concepts as having the gate uh, in the corner closest to the direction you want them to go. So if your barn is to the north and you've got a lane that runs north and south and your gate is on the south end of that lane and you create a button hook, 
what's going to happen is you'll have half the cows in the lane and half the cows in the pasture and you'll have to chase them and play with them and simple concepts is place placing a gate in the closest corner so that way they don't dead end themselves or pigeonhole themselves into those situations that'll save you a lot of work now that seems really easy and it's a really simple concept to fix but if you're struggling with that from the get-go and you're those are day-to-day -day operations and you're just trying to get through the first year and if you don't have to even think about that your life's going to be a lot better so that's why i said spend the time with someone who has done some rotational grazing work who understands a little bit about what these systems are supposed to look like and just you know paper's cheap ink's cheap get a good layout set up and a good plan to move forward with i cannot stress that enough one other thing I want to say is all these pictures in these um, presentations are successful operations that I've had the opportunity to work with. I've started counting up the numbers and I've, I know hundreds of rotational grazers. And that's the other thing that I want to point out to anybody looking to get started. One of the best things that your ag agent, your NRCS office, or your land conservation department, or even just uh, a person that you trust, those contacts and being able to spread your uh, network out so you can get either to a pasture walk or one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation with someone who's doing what you want to do, get to that right away so you can see that. I'm a big fan of learning from success and I'm a big fan of copying that and it's also a great way to see what you don't want to do. Like everyone makes the mistake of only asking what they like about grazing but I'm a big fan of also asking what they don't like about grazing so that way you don't get yourself into a situation that isn't for you. Grazing isn't for everybody. And I think it's worth noting that, you know, if you're an equipment guy, you really need to ask yourself, is this the way I want to go? I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I am saying that if this is a type of management that you're not going to like, is that something that you want to be successful with? Now, that being said, if we look at this from the economic standpoint, from the environmental standpoint, from the the net profit standpoint, you absolutely have to consider rotational grazing as an, an alternative or as maybe the best choice for dairy and just animal animal agriculture in Wisconsin. So, so uh, one of my favorite sayings is proper layout. There's no right way, but there are definitely wrong ways. So I should really revisit this map and uh, spend a little more time drawing this up. It's simplified because uh, of a different project we're working on. But I'd like to point this out to you. This would be 80 acres square. So we took this pond out, right? You're not gonna graze the pond. But the one thing I wanna point out, can you, can you guys see my mouse in this picture? Can someone tell me yes or no? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. So this is one of my favorite ways to start a conversation with a rotational grazer or somebody who's interested in that. Look at these fields. We've got 80 acres broken down into four long strips, not quite 80, 60 acres, whatever it is. So this strip, what you don't see here is on this northern end here, we've got a gate here. I work with some of the largest confinement operations in the state. So I'm in northeastern Wisconsin, Green Bay, Confinement, there are more CAFOs per square mile in Green Bay than there are anywhere else in the world per square mile. So we're dealing with large farms, we're dealing with large equipment. And this same concept works for a 20 cow operation or a thousand cow operation. And let me explain that a little bit because this is one way so that way you don't pigeonhole yourself into specific pastures and it really allows for a flexible system for grass management. If you've got this perimeter fence built so it's solid, you've got containment, and let's just say for a dairy operation, or this is a beef operation, we'll talk beef. We've got uh, this single strand fence down the middle. If you cut hay and you go around, typically you open up a field and you'll go around four times, you got a 10 foot hay vine. That means you got 40 feet that you typically go around the perimeter of your field. So if this fence up here is 50 feet wide, it doesn't make you harvest a 20 acre field and a 20 acre field. You are still harvesting a 40 acre field. And if this is here and this here, all these ends are open, you can harvest a 100 acre field and still have the flexibility to come out there and do a daily break or every two day or a three day break or whatever your rotation looks like. 
especially because we've got water up there. And you can see clearly in this picture, and I know because I worked with this gentleman or this family, that these are daily breaks. So you can see how they're moving these animals around and moving them there. The other thing that I'd like to point out, especially with beef, is that you really have to ask yourself if a lane is necessary. So I'm not against lanes, we'll get into that a little bit more, but this is a great example of if you rotate around like this, and we've got a gate here, which you don't see. So you can rotate around like this and you can swing through the center here and come over here and you can start coming through and making these figure eight patterns. I don't know if you follow my mouse there or not. What that means is if you started grazing here, so if you didn't do the figure eight, if you started grazing in the Northwest corner and you graze through here and graze through here, and you went up to here and now you're back in this southeast corner how are you going to get your animals back there you're either going to have to spend a lot of time and effort putting up a temporary lane or you're going to have a permanent lane that's left there and most of the time permanent lanes are just kind of abused areas you don't get a ton of production out of them they're a single purpose thing they might be grazed but if you were to do some dry matter clippings on them they're probably not as productive as the pasture so if you can avoid that lane and think about managing your animals so that way you do a figure eight rotation, two things happen. One, you don't ever corner yourself in one corner and two, halfway through every rotation, you're going to be next to the buildings. So it gives a lot of flexibility. Is it always gonna work perfect? Absolutely not. Is it what you wanna do? Um, nobody with the NRCS or any of the agencies I've talked about are looking to tell you what to do in your operation. But these are concepts that we want you to think about. So that's why I say no right way, but there are definitely wrong ways. And just think about that as you're going into this process. <clears throat> so things to consider when designing your pasture layout, labor efficiency. So this is a really big one. And um, I've had these conversations quite a bit and I'll use two examples and um, neither one's right, neither one's wrong. But these are concepts and thoughts that you need to consider as you're designing your operation. Let's just take a 40 acre farm. Let's say you got 40 acres. This was cropland converted to pasture. You're going to graze it, right? One operation takes that 40 acres and divides it into four uniform chunks. Like I talked about, the ends are open. So we've got a 50 foot gate on each end so they can still harvest the whole 40 acres at one time. The other operation says that they don't want to do that and they want to just have polywire for complete flexibility. Both very viable systems. I'm not going to say one's better than the other, but the reality is if you come back to that one that's maybe subdivided into two, three or four, five or six, depending on the size of your operation, you've still got the flexibility to um, cut hay off of there. So you've lost nothing from the mechanical management, but you've really made your life quite a bit simpler when it comes to moving that. So I've spent a lot of time putting polywire up in my life and it can be a very enjoyable experience. But what happens a lot of times that I've seen in these situations is uh, you got to feed the cows and you're running late for church. You got to feed the cows and you're uh, kids basketball game is going to be in a half hour. By having a completely temporary setup on the inside, there's a lot more flexibility, but there's also a lot more of time that goes into setting that up and moving that and managing that. And the other thing that you do lose by doing that is with these other systems, if we have those interior fences, we can put a pipeline down there. So that single strand fence will protect that pipeline, but that gives us those different ports where we can have water flowing with us. Now we can have a front fence and a back fence and we can easily have animals confined on an area for one day, two days, three days, seven days. You know, you, you've got that flexibility to move. You can absolutely do that with temporary fence, but that's why I say labor efficiency, understand what you want this to look like. It can be a ton of work if you're going to go with the temporary route. Not wrong, but just think about that prior to getting into this. Secondly, how intensive do you want to graze? So this is a big one for me. We're all into farming and agriculture for different reasons, but the reality is we all need to stay in business if we want to continue farming. So there is an economic portion of this that we need to consider. And I've proven this to myself, I'll prove it to anybody. I have done thousands of clippings on pasture. And the reality is, if you move those animals more often, you get more dry matter per acre over the course of the season. 
So uh, three day graze versus one day graze, that one day over the course of entire season, over the course of the next three years, means more dry matter production. And dry matter for a grazer means milk, it means beef, it means profit. So you gotta balance that with life and your situation, whether you're working off a farm or what you can do. But if you've got this system set up so it's super easy, that doesn't even take hardly any time to move them every day or every 12 hours or whatever you wanna do, absolutely go for the dry matter. You get the profit, you get the better grass management and grass is like a muscle. The more you graze it, the more you work it, the harder it works for you. And I can't stress that enough. You know, there, there's a management as aspect that goes along with grazing, but if you get out there and you start working your grass, working your muscles, it's only gonna produce more for you. And I've seen that time and time again. Uh, let's just talk about the differences here. And we'll use a, we'll use a little more extreme example because that uh, will show the picture a little better. We've got a one day rotation versus a seven day rotation. What happens is if you've got a seven day rotation, you've probably got one water tank, or even if you've got a portable water tank, those animals are gonna congregate around that water tank, whether it's one day or seven days, all right? So over the course of one day, you put them in there, they go and they graze everything. And if you've got an intensely set up system with a lot of animals into it, they're gonna go in there, there's a competition, there's a herd effect where they'll actually graze and they'll do a uniform job of grazing. If you give them enough forage for seven days and you put those same number of animals in there, they're gonna go across the whole area. They're gonna run around the perimeter and they're gonna cherry pick everything. And their intake on the first day is gonna be off the charts. Second day is gonna be a little less. The third day it's a little less, fourth day less, fifth day less. And also what happens is June, July, and August happen. So at two o'clock in the afternoon, we know that that herd's gonna be either congregated around the, the water tank or the one tree that's in that pasture. So you're not doing any manure distribution. You're not just distributing the urine. So you don't have that, uh, those minimal gains every time. And that shows up over the course of a grazing season and it shows up over the course of an entire multiple years. You can really start to see this effect over the course of three, four, five years, a decade. And it's very apparent for anyone who's spent any time with rotational grazing to go in there and you can predict what the management is. I'll be right most of the time. Um, the other time, how much time are you willing to spend? We got into that a little bit. I am a big believer that we should have enough fence. I don't think we need more fence than you need to spend. You know, fence is a pain, it's something that can go wrong. But if you've got enough fence so you can easily manage your operation, so you can maximize dry matter, uh, it's a real win-win situation. The animals win, you win with the grass, and ultimately your pocketbook wins. The other thing we talked about now too was the animal movement. So uh, if you're able to move those animals stepwise and keep them going forward, that's super, beneficial. So if you didn't have a fence, I'm going to go back here. All right. So if you only, let's just look at this one side. If you only graze from the north down to the south, and there's nothing wrong with it. People do that all the time. But if, if you had the lane up on the north end and you grazed down to here and you didn't have a gate on this end, What's gonna happen is you've got to walk your whole herd along this entire field and come back up here where a, well, a gate on this end allows you to button up them around. It saves you time, it's less stressful on the animals and everybody wins. This is what I was getting at before I said, think about how you wanna set these up. The other thing that people a lot of times don't consider is these single strand interior fences, put a couple gates in the middle of them. So that way, if you're here and you wanna scoot them across over there, zip them on over. Fences are easy, especially in single strand situations. So just put them where you want them to be. I would become really good at building fence. And if you're having the fence built by a fencing contractor, I'd spend some time watching how they do that so you can learn as they're out there. Um, the other thing is what type of animals. Uh, that does make a huge difference, whether it's dairy, whether it's beef, whether it's uh, stockers, all these things need to be considered when designing your pastures. And the biggest, the biggest difference there is going to be um, the difference between a beef operation, whether stockers or cow calf, they're very similar versus a dairy operation 
versus a heifer operation. And heifers that are bred are more like a beef cow operation. You don't need to worry about them. They've got their water out there. They're very easy to put out on pasture. The, the challenging group with heifers, whether it's beef or dairy, are going to be that group that is not bred yet, especially if you're thinking about using AI. Then you got to figure out how you're going to bring them home. And it becomes more of a like a dairy herd operation. You want to consider a lane system. You'll want to consider how you're going to capture them and just what your strategy is. Also, especially with dairy heifers on pasture, you have to keep an eye on them. Uh, dairy cows can do fantastic on grass. Dairy heifers can do fantastic on grass, but not all dairy heifers always do fantastic on grass without a little bit of extra. When I say a little bit extra, maybe a little bit of corn, maybe a little bit of oats, whatever you decide with your nutritionist or, or whoever you're working with, but just keep an eye on them, especially those littler ones. Anything under 600 pounds, keep an eye on because you don't want them to go backwards. Um, water, we talked a little bit about that. We'll talk more about that as we get into this. But water with rotational grazing is what makes this work. By having water where your brakes are, you are able to put the manure in one place, you're able to put the urine in one place, and then you're not having them walk back across areas that have already been grazed. And that's very important because residual is important. And after three days, grass starts to regrow. And that's like the candy, new shoots. So if you've got a five acre paddock that you're grazing from one end to the next, and it takes five days to get across there, you're on the fifth day, and they're walking across those new shoots, they're grazing those new shoots as they're going to that new break. And the way I equate this to is like a bruise. You've got a bruise and you keep hitting it and hitting it, hitting it, it doesn't ever go away. And you can prove this to yourself. You can make a pasture hoop, you can make a ring, you can take any dry matter measurement however you want. And you can see how these, these management techniques, if you just apply them a little bit and just think about how you're rotating these animals, they all add up into making you a much more successful operation. I've seen this time and time and time again. I cannot stress that enough. The most important thing as a grazer that you can do is residual. Don't think three to four inches, think six to eight. Rest so that your pasture's got enough time to rest. If you can think residual and rest, you're gonna win. And the other thing too is don't think about, uh, one thing for people switching over to pastures, is they've got a real hard time thinking about leaving five, six inches of residual there and they're used to seeing a clean cut hay field. Every time I've done clippings on that, you win with dry matter over the course of the season. You don't have to think about taking hay off and getting every little bit. People take hay off of a field because it's expensive, so they want to take everything off there. But if you think about the way grass grows, that is not an optimal way to harvest. You can work with your animals, you can work with the way grass grows, and you can win with that. And I can't stress that enough. The other thing is landscape. Uh, I'm a huge fan of trying to take a look at what you've got. If you've got hills, if you've got wet spots, these all should be thought about in the initial planting stage. Isolate out those low wet spots, isolate out, isolate out those sandy knolls, so that way they're in the bigger pasture unit of more consistent soils. So that way when you put the cattle there, that you can allow that area to be grazed uniformly. But more importantly, if that area is not ready to be grazed next, skip it, let it have the time so that way you can give it the rest it needs and you can work with the topography of your property and set these up. Also, you can work with the landscape from the standpoint of, hey, that high dry spot is perfect for winter water. Or I'm gonna run this lane on the contour here. I'm gonna run on the top of the hill. So that way you can utilize what you've got to your advantage. So types of fences. The way this uh, presentation is structured is, it's really talking about a lot of the way NRCS can help assist with cost sharing. And I should get into that a little bit. So NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, who I work for, uh, straight up, if I wasn't able to do grazing, I'd be very surprised if I was working with the NRCS. Luckily, I'm able to do rotational grazing and work with conservation and they mesh together really nicely. So it's a ton of fun. I have a lot of fun with my job. I enjoy it. If you have any questions about this, let me know. Contacts that I have, across the state or people, if I can help anybody in any way, absolutely, that's what I like doing. I love making those connections. That being said, I always give the same disclaimer. I work with everybody. So if you got a problem with somebody, keep it with yourself because I'm still gonna work with them. I'm still gonna work with you. So just a little side note, I'm joking. But so NRCS is not necessarily interested in grazing. So we, 
I, I gotta say this with like the quotes, right? NRCS is interested in soil quality, soil erosion, and water quality, and trying to keep all those things in a very positive direction. Why rotational grazing works is because if you look at soil health, if you look at the potential for carbon sequestration, if we look at the potential for infiltration of our rainwater, I mean, everything we've got, we're basically creating huge buffers. And then you multiply that with good management and you leave six, eight inches of residual, which is perfect for like getting deeper roots and having that water infiltrate. And it also just happens to be what a producer needs to get as much dry matter on their property as they can, which is what makes you money. Like everything meshes really nice together. So when I say this, that NRCS is not necessarily interested in grazing, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, we're absolutely interested in rotational grazing, but it's for a very different reason than you are. But that doesn't mean that there isn't an awesome opportunity to work with us and to work with our specialists and to get more of this on the landscape because everybody wins. You win as a farmer, you win from the environmental standpoint, the animals live, win from just like a health and body condition standpoint and the public and the environment wins. So there's no downside to this if it's managed right. And that's the other really great thing about grazing. A well-managed farm is an advantage to everybody. And I can't stress that enough. So when we talk about this though, we do need to have resource concerns if we're going to um, contract grazing. So not everybody who's interested in grazing is going to get a grazing plan or grazing cost share from NRCS. That being said, it's, it's a very um, desirable practice. It's something that we wanna encourage people to reach out to us. And even if you don't wanna take our cost sharing, you know, we're still here to help you. I mean, we are public service and we wanna see this on there. So. But part of this is we get into the different practices and fence is one of the major practices that we help people set up and cost your on. And you get that with a good grazing plan. Let's talk about some of the different styles of fence that there are out there, especially if you're a beginning grazer. So we do um, a lot of fence. I've cost shared on this um, multi-strand non-electric fence several times. Um, I, I'm not a, if I'm gonna be honest, I'm not a really huge fan of this. It's more expensive, it requires more posts and there's no predator protection, um, but, but it can work. And in certain situations, it's really the right thing to go to. But this is definitely not one of the first fences that I would recommend to any person looking to get into rotational grazing. There's just, it's more expensive to build and there's less flexibility with it. That being said, if it's the, the fence or the practice that fits the situation that you need, then you should absolutely do that. But this is one of the things we look at. This multi-strand fence, usually it's not electrified and it's got enough wire so that way it's gonna prevent animals from going through. It is a physical barrier. I do not recommend this for sheep or goats at all. They're not gonna stay. Barbed wire fence. This is another one that I'm not a huge fan of it. It doesn't give you the flexibility that an electric fence, the electric fence does. However, that being said, if we're going through uh, an area that we can't energize or uh, it's, a, it's a problematic area, I mean, there's definitely places for these. But in general, if we're looking at cost, if we're looking at getting set up from the get-go, these would probably be secondary or even tertiary on a list to look at. I'm not saying you shouldn't, and if this is what you want on your operation, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but they do cost more and you lose flexibility with this. There are places where they work really well, so I'm not trying to give you my biases on this, but we just need to talk about application and where they really fit. And Adam, then, yes, go ahead. I quick interrupt you? I had a quick question here. How much does an NRCS grazing plan cost, and are there income requirements for NRCS cost sharing? Uh, there, first of all, an NRCS grazing plan, uh, we cost you on cap plans, but right now we've got multiple agreements across the state where we can get one written for free. So what, if you're interested in pursuing this, and if you're interested specifically in pursuing an NRCS equip contract, you should contact me or your NRCS office, and we can get you in, in contact with technical service providers writing those plans. Now that's not probably always going to be that way in Wisconsin because our systems and our, our cost sharing programs full. So if we can't offer you that, then a lot of times we'll write them in house for free with the NRCS if we have time. Otherwise, what we do is we offer what we call a CAP plan, which is a conservation activity plan. In this case, it would be conservation activity plan for rotational grazing. I know that's a lot of NRCS mumble jumble. 
the reality is if you want to do it, talk to your local office, your local NRCS office, and they will give you the best option for the particular time. And our equip cycles are usually one time a year to potentially two times a year. So if you're thinking about rotational grazing in two years, the best thing you can do right now is get into your an NRCS office and get an application so we get the planning done. So that way you're ready to go when the grass is green. The other question was, um, are there income limitations? There are income limitations and it's not a low end limitation, it's an upper end limitation. I think I'd have to double check that 950,000. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to go back and look at, I mean, it. you have to make a lot of money to not be eligible for our programs. Um, the advantage though, especially with this group, I'm thinking is that we're a lot of beginning farmers. So if you haven't filed the schedule F, which is the farm schedule for your taxes, or if you filed that for 10 years or less, you are considered a beginning farmer. So what that means is you're eligible for a higher level of cost share because we wanna promote this type of agriculture and we wanna promote young farmers on the landscape. So this is another thing, I can't stress this enough. If you are interested in rotational grazing, if this is the way you wanna go, you should absolutely talk to one of our offices because we'll help you through this process. Now, that being said, these are federal contracts. There are rules, there are standards that we need to follow. So understand both aspects of that. So that way you don't get yourself into a situation that you don't like and the NRC, no one wants to be a bad guy. We're only here, this, this really is designed to help people get into grazing and to promote conservation. So it's, a, it's been a ton of fun. Like I said, I got a great job. I hope that answered the question. So that being said, I got to use one of my favorite jokes now uh, from a goat farmer that I worked with up in, I think it was Price County. Uh, so he was putting up a nine strand barbed wire fence for his goats. And most of the time I use a, a high tensile woven wire for goats and sheep. But his comment to me was, how do you know if a fence is goat proof? I'm like, I don't know. How do you tell if a fence is goat proof? He said, you need a five gallon bucket of water and you throw it at the fence. If any water goes through, so will it go. And I say that tongue in cheek, but the reality is for goats and sheep, you really better, you better invest in a good fence. I've seen sheep, I've seen flocks of sheep controlled with one strand polywire, but that is not the exception, or that is the exception, that is not the rule. Uh, Woven wire perimeter for predator protection or multi-strand high tensile with a good old shock on it does a lot for keeping sheep and goats in those areas. So even though they're smaller, you're always gonna need a better fence to keep those animals in. And this is my favorite style fence right here. So this fence, uh, you probably, if you've done any work with the NRCS, you've probably worked with the gentleman who built this corner post. Uh, I've done a lot of work with him, I won't say names. But the reality is, is a floating brace with a three strand um, high tensile, this lasts and this is good. This is a style of fence that I grew up with. It's, uh, we've had floating braces on my farm or my parents' farm for over 20 years. Do they move? Yes. Are they more maintenance than a, like a straight up H brace? Um, will they hold as much? No, they won't hold as much. There's give and take with everything. But the reality is, it's way cheaper to put these in. They're easy to do. You pound one post in and you can get going. I like to call these user fences. So this fence with a little bit of maintenance on it every year is going to last you 20, 25, 30 years. And it's going to be a lot easier and less expensive for you to get into it. Now, if you're concerned about long-term maintenance or if you've got soils that are super wet or you know not very stable, there is reason to consider an H bracing. Like I said before, I'm not going to say one's, I'm not going to say this is better than the other one, but if we're getting new farmers into rotational grazing, this system tends to be the cheapest, easiest way to get them in. And I know because I look at a lot of different fills every year, so I can say without a doubt, this is the cheapest, most efficient fence from a cost share and dollar for dollar buck to get you into grazing. Now, a lot of these people do upgrade to an H brace down the road and a lot of them don't. So you really need to understand which way you wanna go. But this, like I say in this slide, this is typically my first recommendation for Wisconsin grazers to go to. And temporary fence. If, if you wanna be a successful rotational grazer, and when I say rotational grazer, I'm not talking about seven day huge blocks, I'm talking about three days or less, two days or less, and in my opinion, one day or less, 
on average, you need to understand how to implement temporary fence. And this is gonna be your day-to-day -to -day tool. Do not skimp on this, buy the good stuff. Buy the stainless steel stranded, multi-strand stainless steel, good pasture or good polywire. Get a good step in post, one that's not coated with plastic or, or plastic junk that's gonna break. You know, I'm not supposed to talk brands and I won't talk brands, but you, you gotta be really careful if you're going to like the big box stores like Fleet Farm or Tractor Supply. And they, they carry some really good stuff at times. And then I'll go back in there and I'll look what's on the shelf and they'll have a completely different brand on there. And you don't even rec you don't even know until you start to use it, that even though these posts look the exact same, that they're made of a different plastic. And within three months, they're white, they're faded, they're brittle, and they're breaking down the field. I cannot stress enough, buy good tools that you're gonna be using every day. Buy a good reel, buy a good step and post, and buy a good polyware, because you're gonna be friends with it. And so this is a plastic, this is a different type of step in plastic post. Um, but what this does is it allows you to set up fence when whatever shape you want. I'm a big fan of poly wire to be straight, because if you start bending poly wire, you got these corners and these L's or any odd shape. Cows graze around with them all the time. Can you do it? Absolutely. But if you are going to have a problem with poly wire, whether it's in the summer or the winter, it's where you bend it or angle it. It's the weak point. It's the point where the cows are gonna cut that tight and they're gonna knock it over. That's just been my observation. And, you know, everyone's got their own own opinions on that. So I'm not gonna, I, I won't sit there and I'll say that there's not other things that go into that, but I'm a big fan of straight lines from a solid high tensile fence to a solid high tensile fence, and making a nice square box or as square as you can, those straight lines prevent those angles in those corners for cows to cut short for them to bump against and they're just going to have less trouble and that's been my observation over the course of doing this. Um, this system is the backbone with the water line that allows you to do a 12 hour break or a 24 hour break and I come back to make sure you buy quality stuff when you do this. A lot of the times Fleet Farm will carry some poly wire and I haven't looked here lately but if it's aluminum just let it alone. Those wires that start moving like this are going to break. All right, things to remember about a fence. Keep it simple. Straight, straight lines, keep it simple. Make it easy, keep it flexible so that way you don't box yourself in. Like I've worked with people who want a whole bunch of one day breaks. They, they've built, you know, acres and acres of one to two strand um, boxes for their animals, for fence. It's very expensive to build. Um, it is very difficult to manage with any equipment of any size. And then what happens when the grass is eight inches tall versus what happens when the grass is 16 inches tall? It's never going to be perfect. Now, that being said, if that's what you want, I'm not here to tell you how to graze and you can figure out how to manage that for yourself. But I think you can see that by doing that, you've limited your flexibility on that particular property for the long run. Your opportunity to make or harvest or do any type of mechanical harvest on that has instantly been limited. Now, it comes down to goals. You need to understand what you want your operation to look like, what's easy for you to manage. And like I said, we're not here to tell you how to do that. And if you can take that system and you can keep it at the residual heights that we were talking about, then we can still help you with that for cost share. And you can still win with that, but it's just, it's way more expensive and you do lose flexibility. So keep that in mind. The other thing that I want to stress here is a good fence does not make you a good grazer. It's absolutely true. Uh, the best grazer I ever worked with actually could keep his cows in an area with uh, the plastic string from around them. I'm, I'm not even joking. Just because you've got pretty fence and pretty pipelines, you've got all this, that doesn't mean you're a successful rotational grazer. Just because your cows are out on pasture does not mean you're a successful rotational grazer. When I talk about successful rotational grazing, I'm talking about pastures that are producing as much, most of the time, more than any equivalent crop field of the same mix. And I can prove that to you because you just look at the way things grow and start taking some clippings. I've said that time and time again, but if you wanna try it, I mean, let's meet up 
and I'll take a uh, well-managed pasture and then you can take me to the best alfalfa field or the best hay field you've got. And I win because what happens is you're taking one to four or probably four, three to four cuttings off of a hay field and you're taking it right down to probably two and a half, three inches because it's expensive to run equipment across there. So you're gonna get four cuttings off of there and you're probably gonna wait for it to be taller so you can get as much yield off of it as you can. With a pasture situation, we're probably grazing it at two thirds the height of the height that you're cutting it. So we've got more sun getting down into the soil. That means we've got more seeds per square foot. So we've got more plants per square foot and we're grazing it down to six inches. So we're not taking it as much there, but we can graze that six, seven. I've had people graze eight plus times in a year. Not typically, but it's not uncommon to get six grazing off of some of these sites in a year. So you're out there potentially two times more often on a thicker, denser stand. And if you start taking a look at dry matter weights, you always win with the more dense. If you measure weight per inch, density always wins. So we've got a denser site that we're able to come back to potentially twice as much of the time. And we're grazing or cutting it at two thirds of what you would with your other, um, with your equipment. So it doesn't take too much math to figure out just why that can potentially work. But you need to understand, none of this equation works unless you're willing to commit to the management of it. Everything I've talked about today hinges on you as a producer willing to do the management for this to work. It's really what it is. And what does that mean? It means don't overgraze it and give it enough time to recover. And when I say don't overgraze it, make sure you leave five, six inches of grass out there with the cool seasons for grazing and give it you know, recovery could be 15 days in May, but don't come back to that site until it's 12, 14, 16 inches tall, depending on what you want for quality, but give that grass the time so that way you're not abusing it like that bruise that you keep hitting. And then the ultimate goal, like we talk about, is to maximize dry matter production. And this is important for you as a producer. It's also important for us as conservationists because that, that conservation aspect that means your farm is an active buffer. It's soil erosion that's not happening. It's water quality that's being improved. Infiltration, the water's going down. You win from that infiltration during the summer slump and you get more yield over the course of the season. <coughs> Excuse me. Adam? Yes, go ahead. All right, we have a bunch of questions here. Wanted to get some of these out. Um, so there's some that talk a little bit about summer grazing. I think you're gonna get there, but um, one of the questions is NRCS typically pays for a certain number of strands based on type of animals and for exterior versus interior fencing. Is that correct? We have standards that have ranges within them, but that is correct. Um, for our standards for cows, it's based off of the lowest or the least cost option. So you can always put more fence in than what we have, but the way our scenarios are written are multi-strand perimeters, single strand interiors, then we've got a multi-strand uh, fence that also includes the woven wire. So it's not like there's a ton of range in there, but you do need to choose the appropriate payment scenario that will also then go with the animal type. Now, it doesn't always, it's not like you're gonna get rich taking NRCS cost share, but the reality is, is you if, if you work with us, if you, so let's say you spent the exact same money that you would working with NRCS versus not working with NRCS, the outcome is gonna be completely different. You're going to have a long-term well-built fence that's gonna be better than, than what you could have done by yourself. And that's how you have to think about cost share. Hope that answered the question. Okay, another question. Um, what is your recommendation for pastured pork fencing? Mm, good question. I don't know yet. Um, pigs are a real challenge. Um, and I don't say that to sound negative about them because I, I do enjoy a good pork chop and I buy grass finished pork and it's great. Um, but the reality is, is that even the ones that say they don't rut, I haven't really seen operations where rutting hasn't been a problem and, or at least been something to think about. And then they start rolling that over the top of the wires. What I've seen most successful are uh, portable type of really hot energized fences. Fence that you can move away from where that line is where the pigs have gone up to. That's what I've seen as the most successful. I don't know that there isn't a better system out there. I'm just not sure what it is yet. Okay, great. Um, 
Another one, what's the best practice for dealing with the spring flush of pasture growth versus the late summer drought when pastures don't regrow? Absolutely. This is a great one. The best thing is to have 20% more acres in your system than you think you'll need for grazing and making sure that those farms, are, your farm is set up so you can easily mechanically harvest off of it. You take the excess in spring and you put it up for winter feed and because you've got extra acres than you thought you would need. So if your grazing plan says you need 50 acres, put in 75. So that way, when July and August strike, you're not feeding your stored feed to the animals that you have already spent the time and money and energy on to put up. That's the biggest mistake that I see people doing. They're planning so tight but if you actually put a dollar amount on grazing versus what it costs for putting up store feed, you would be stunned. We're talking the difference of two to three dollars a day per animal for every day that you're feeding store feed. And that's something that I really want people to think about. Every day on pasture is money in your pocket. Every day they're grazing is money in your pocket. So if you are cutting it so tight, that can work maybe five out of 10 years, but get that extra acreage in there. So what if you harvest it for hay? You, you design these systems so they're flexible so you can go out there and take that hay off, but then if you need it, you can run a fence over there and graze it. And that way you can manage the spring flush and you can also manage the summer slump. Great. Um, along those same lines, when the mid late summer drought arrives and the rotation must be interrupted until the paddock resumes growing, should a permanent sacrifice pen be built that's used year after year to park the livestock or can the livestock be parked in a place until ro rotation can resume so that each year a different part of the farm is sacrificed each season during the drought? So I'm a bigger fan of rotate. I'm not a big fan of permanent sacrifice areas, unless, unless you've got a lot of like really sensitive type property where you don't have a lot of places to go. But the reality is if you put cows in the same spot every single year, think about the N, P, and K that you're piling up there that you're not taking advantage of. Now think about sacrifice in the summertime as like outwintering in the wintertime. If you're able to move that site every year, now you've got the opportunity to renovate that site, to bring in new seeds, Bring in better quality grass seeds like the grass seeds over the last 15 20 years their quality and quantity is they're they're just way better than they were so this is an opportunity to bring in some really high producing seeds in an area that you just beat up a little bit and you put a bunch of manure and urine on it that's an opportunity for you as a producer now if you're going back to the same site every single year that site's never going to recover and you probably lost it, there's probably going to be some compaction issues and you've lost all the manure and urine on that. But I would also tie that back to the previous comment where if you've got the acreage, get another double your grazing acres from what you think you need because if you're cutting hay to bring it to the animals in summer, like it's one thing if you got to buy because you're out of if you're out of land. But if you're cutting hay, think about how you can get those animals over to that hay. It's way cheaper. And I've done enough spreadsheets, I've done enough math, I've talked to enough economists. The reality is animals on pasture in Wisconsin, whether it's beef or dairy, you know, we're in the range of say, say 50 cents to a buck 50 a day. That's really kind of the range. It, in every situation is unique and I'm not good, I'm just giving average ranges here. That being said, if you're feeding them stored feed, even if it's on pasture, but it's on a dry lot, you're at a buck fifty to maybe over three dollars a day. It's costing you money if you have to bring them stored feed there. Get that polywire out that we talked about and fence in your hay field, or get a fencing contractor in there, or buy some high tensile and put it up yourself. High tensile is super simple once you understand what it is. And if you get dairy cows and beef cows, it doesn't meet our standard, but a one strand high tensile fence will keep the cows all day long. I grew up with nothing but one strand high tensile kept in over 150 beef cows. No issues. Everyone's concerned about the calves. The calves aren't going to leave where their mamas are. Just get them used to the fencing system. You've trained them all summer long, and then you can take them to wherever you want to go. Great. Changing gears a little bit, would you recommend using electric netting fence for goats at all? Yes and no. Um, it absolutely works. Uh, the problem with goats and sheep with electronet, and it's probably the first thing I would tell people to start out with, but there is the potential for um, them to get tangled into it. I don't say that to scare you from that. I just say that you should be aware of that as you're buying that product. I, actually, I think that electronet is probably the most consistent way to control sheep and goats in a rotationally grazed system. 
Now, that being said, I would also par that with uh, a good perimeter fence and good interior fences so that you can easily do that. Because if you're setting up multiple strands of electronet every single day, it is a huge workload. So if you can set up your interior fences so that they're less than 200 feet apart, you only need one or two rolls of electronet. So you've got more interior fences again, but it's easier to move them. I come back to, if you keep the ends open, you can still harvest up and down there. And you've created all these long, narrow fields that are efficient for you to harvest with a tractor, and they're really easy for you to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, that being said, there's some other really good reels out there. There's some, I forget what they're called. They're the Gallagher sells one where it's multiple reels on and the posts are all stuck together. I've seen people use that with good success, um, mostly with sheep. I don't know if I've seen that with goats yet, uh, but I think that that would work very well as well. Great. Um, another question. There's only a couple more here. We were thinking about getting into the holistic grazing, but really need to start slow. What advice would you give someone who's going to ease into a grazing operation? Read Alan Savory's book first. I, I say that jokingly because I've taken a holistic management class and I absolutely agree with it. If you're talking about holistic grazing or rotational grazing, understand that they're not the same, but they can be. Uh, think about what your goals are get that written down on paper and really figure out what you want to do and where you want to take your operation. There's nothing wrong with easing into grazing. I still recommend that you work with a, a planner who can set your operation up in like phases or steps. So that way you've got the big plan, you've got the big picture and you can take it on a step-by-step -step approach. So you don't get yourself into a situation where like, man, I really wish I would have just done that from the get-go. And the, a great example of this is, you know, if you've got 40 acres and you want to graze and you want to phase up into it or build into this, if you put a perimeter fence around 20 acres, all right, and you're just going to graze this first 20 first, absolutely works. But if you take a look at the true cost of that versus just fencing the entire 40 right away, keeping half as a hay field and half for grazing, you're going to be shocked at how much more it costs you to do that because you've got to bring the contractor back. Now you spent all that extra money on an entire length of interior fence that probably could have been significantly less. And those are just the things that you think about prior to jumping into this. But that plan to start is going to be the basis for that and design it so that it's built in such a way that you can expand into it. That's the first way to start. There's a lot of different things in each situation is specific. So if they want to talk more about that, we could too. Okay, great. Um, looking into seeding, we plan to frost seed this spring. What's a good grass legume Forbes mixture you'd recommend to improve a pasture that's mainly grass hay now and any suppliers to recommend? Um, this is a more difficult question here. <clears throat> and we'll get into this a little bit more, but we'll answer it right now. I do need to have clarification. What is the grass in the pasture right now? What does it consist of? Ooh, that's going to take a little bit to get that answer back. If whoever put that answer out there, if you could let us know. Let me, let me, we'll wait for that and I'll explain. Because if you have a bluegrass, a brome, or a quackgrass pasture, and you're talking about frosting into them, it's a very difficult thing to do. It's very difficult to even no-till into those situations. It's absolutely possible, but the uh, challenge of it goes up immensely. So you really have to be aware of what you're going into. Now, if we're talking about orchard grass or an alfalfa field and you want to frost seed into that, we've got a lot of bare soil in those plantings typically. We've got a lot of opportunity for that seed to touch and get a hold of it in the ground. And we've got the opportunity potentially that that seed's going to grow. So your likelihood of success is so much greater in a bunch grass or an existing field situation than in a continuously grazed or an old pasture situation. Um, I would not recommend frost seeding into uh, a permanent grass pasture like bluegrass, chrome, or plaque. You can try it, and I've seen it work, but I would probably be more on the lines of you don't want to do a renovation that I would tell you to no-till, and I would tell you to do it in August, not in the summer. Okay. And their answer, they said they're not exactly sure. It was a horse pasture, so orchard grass mainly. If it was a horse pasture, it's probably more likely a lot of bluegrass, which is one of the more difficult grasses to get into. And I don't say that to disagree with them because they know their place, but horses tend to overgraze. And what happens with overgraze sites is bluegrass encroaches. So I would be 
very surprised if there wasn't a significant amount of bluegrass there. And that's the most difficult one to establish some of these other new seedings into. So please do a little more research before you spend money on seed with that so you don't get yourself just wasting money. And we could talk about different options after we have that information. Now, that being said, uh, I've got two main mixes that work fantastic in Wisconsin for probably 50 to 70% of the operations we're dealing with. Uh, one, and I'm not supposed to use names, but Byron has the, what they call the Grassworks mix. And the Grassworks mix is phenomenal. And what it is, is it's a um, metal fescue, festiolum, um, annual rye, red clover, and white clover. And they've got different varieties of those in there. And that mix has been phenomenal on uh, your heavier soils, your wetter soils. It does like a little wetter foot. There's some drawbacks with that mix because it doesn't dry down very well. So if you're looking for a mostly grazing mix that if you do want to put up for stored feed, you're going to put in a silo, you're going to put in a bag, it's absolutely the one to tell you to go. Now, if you're looking for a, a mix that's more on the lines of you want to put it up for dry hay, um, orchard grass, red clover, and timothy is fantastic. Now, there's so many more, and you really need to, before you just take these general recommendations, you really need to take a look at your soils on your place, and you need to see what you've got, and this comes back to course the NRCS office, and we can walk you through this so that way you get the appropriate seed mixes on it. In general, though, those two do really good for most of the state. But sandy soils are a problem, and super wet soils are a problem, you need to be aware of that. And also sod bomb soils. Those are real things to think about as you're building into a grazing operation. Okay. One more question on planting. Um, oh, oh, I guess there's two more. Did, did, did you say you would suggest tilling and seeding in August with bluegrass? I would. If you're going, the most successful pasture renovations I've worked on have been done in August, seedings. Um, if you've got bluegrass and if you're, uh, it depends on what you're, what you're doing. Like if you're a dairy farmer and you've got a crop rotation, I'd tell you to, especially if you're organic, I'd tell you to put it in the corn or small grains and take that off for a year and let that rest. And then I'd seed that down, either use a nurse crop or seed it down in August. That's a really good way to reestablish on the bluegrass. Otherwise, uh, I would overgraze that pasture graze it right down in the ground and I would wait to watch the forecast and hopefully get rain and I'd drill it in two days before a rainstorm on August because that has been successful in the past. In spring, we've got the spring flush. Things are just growing so fast that it's really hard to keep enough competition down to let those seedlings grow and establish well. I'll come back to it's absolutely possible. I'm just trying to give you the, the more successful options with this. Okay. Um, another planting question. Do you recommend planting part of the acreage in warm season forages for the summer drought? If yes, how about tall fescue, legume for both mid late summer grazing and then for winter grazing? So I've, I've worked with multiple seedings of native plantings. And I think we have to be realistic about Wisconsin and its growing zones with um, warm season grasses. The reality is, is they're really cool. They can have a real benefit, but you can't go into, from my experience, production should not be the main goal with establishing warm season grasses, especially if you're in the upper two thirds of Wisconsin. The cool seasons just have too much advantage. Now, if you wanna keep the natives in there for wildlife benefit and you want the dry matter and you're willing to manage the site, that's appropriate for the timing and grazing of the natives, it can absolutely work. Uh, you will lose production, especially in the first few years as they're getting established. Uh, there can be long-term benefits from it, but it's never been uh, a recommendation of mine if you're looking at, at, if production is your only goal. So just take that with a grain of salt. If you're looking for soil health, if you're looking for wildlife benefits, if you've got other goals, it can absolutely be a benefit. So that's my stance on the super cool, but just go into it with some education as to how and when to graze them. Tall fescue, not a fan of it. I've got pictures and I've been on too many farms where, um, you know, the best example I've gotten, I might, I might even have it in the pictures here. I'll see if I can get it a little bit later. I've got a picture of, I said meadow fescue before, 
in the grass works mix. That is not tall fescue. Estiolium is not tall fescue. The soft leaf tall fescues and the endophyte free tall fescues, I know they've made improvements on those varieties, but I directly observe every summer when we've got those in old hay fields, straight up refusal. And what happens when you put a really succulent like the meadow fescue or the festiolum or the ryegrass in those pastures with tall fescue and alfalfa, what happens is they overgraze the succulents down to the ground and they leave the tall fescue. And then it doesn't get grazed, it gets refused, and it's not, it doesn't work really great for those type of mixes. So be aware, I'm not a fan of tall fescue for grazing. It works fantastic as a hay, whether you're putting up dryer and sow, it also works fantastic if you're looking at stockpiling because of that stiffer stem. But if it's part of your summer grazing mix, proceed with caution. And then the final part of the question, I can't remember what that was. Um, let's see. Um, how about tall fescue legume for both mid late summer grazing and then for winter grazing? Yeah. I I, I think you're better off managing with more grasses if grazing is your goal. Like if, if it's a hay field that you might graze, tall fescue can work. You have to force them to eat it, especially if they've been eating like some more succulent types of grasses all summer long. And that can, that can work in that situation. You know, there's opportunities with every grass, but I'm more of a fan, let's choose the grasses that we don't have to force them on. So we don't limit intake, we don't limit production and we'd be better off having more acres and pasture in that situation. Now, if you've got a hay field out there that you plan to stockpile and it's a super dry drought a year and it's where you got to go to and it's there, absolutely graze. That's why I say proceed with caution with tall fescue. It has historically been, I want to say a problem because there's good parts of it, but it, for the midsummer and early summer grazing, I've seen straight up refusal. Okay. Great. So now it looks like we're going to be back to your presentation. The last question I have here is what's your experience and or preference on powered fence chargers, uh, specifically electrical versus solar? Absolutely. We're going to get into that, but I'll tell you straight up, if you've got a plug, plug it in. I love solar. I think it's cool. I'm very much into renewable energies. Just personally, I've been researching it myself. But the reality is, is that I think that we've got some good options on the market for solar power fences but they're way more expensive, or they had been the last time I checked, which was last year, than uh, equivalent powered fencers that we can run a plug off of. But I come back to, again, if your goal is a renewable system, or if you're looking at different, if you've got different goals other than just maintaining a charge, you can absolutely get some pretty great solar systems out there, but they do cost more. So, so fence energy, right on. That's perfect lead into this, right? I've got a lot of experience with energizers. I've looked at a lot of these and they're usually the first place I look if there's a problem on a farm with, with the fence and we're having issues with the energizer and the ground system. So power from the fence should be supplied via the same size wire as the fence. So what I mean by that is you don't want to go from a uh, from 14 gauge to a 12 and a half gauge. So you got your fence terminal, don't go from small wire and feed out to your larger diameter fence wire because you've automatically constricted the current on that wire. And you're doing that right from the get-go. You've got a 12 and a half gauge wire fence, which is what we require for equip, get a 12 and a half gauge lead wire out to that fence. You're just gonna have a better scenario. Will the smaller one work? Absolutely. The problem is, is those dry days in summer when the current doesn't work as well and those cold days in winter when we've got snow and ice and things are frozen and insulated. And a lot of times that doesn't even matter. But if your fence is already kind of working, that could be the straw that takes it to the point where the cows no longer have respect for it. Everyone has to remember with electric fences, these are mental barriers. As soon as they've lost that respect for the mental barrier, how are you going to control those animals? So don't overlook how to set these up. And then the other thing is oxidation. A lot of times, most, most terminals are galvanized stainless steel. And then most wires are galvanized wire, right? That's what we use. How many times have I come onto a farm and they've run a copper uh, wire from the fencer 
out to the, uh, the wire and it's just wrapped around. It only takes a few weeks or summer and all of a sudden everything's orange and blue and you just lost the ability for that thing to easily and effectively transfer current. I come back to, can it work? Yeah, it sure can work. But what's gonna happen is if your fence is already functioning at its capacity, in summer when it's dry, when we need that current or that ground system to come back, or in winter when it's insulated, that's when she's going to fail. So just don't do it. I mean, those are simple, easy things that if you do, you just don't even need to think about it and just get the right water. Test your fence. Seems like a no brainer, right? They've got some really great fencing testers now, ones that can show you where the fault is and they can take you right to where these shorts are. I carry one around in my truck all summer long. I spend a lot of time with people teaching them how to use this because it saves you hours of your life. So don't underestimate buying a good fencer and with today's technology, you absolutely should get one with the help finder. Just telling you, you will save yourself hours of your life. I know I've done it. Now, here. This is uh, my college roommate's uh, adopted brothers. We were at a pasture walk and this is a fun picture that I, he took and I still love using it because it's true. Electric fences are mental boundaries that require training. So remember, these are mental boundaries for these electric fences. And if you don't maintain current on them or if you don't keep them fully charged, you're gonna have those little terrors running out. So those guys are now, uh, 20 years old and in the workforce. So that picture was taken quite a long time ago. And I don't know if you know Tom Kedwalder, but that was his sheep farm when he was still farming sheep. Fun day. Great, quick question on, on fencing. And then we, yep. there are a couple more um, grass questions on, on different types of grasses, but maybe we'll wait a little bit on those. Um, quick question on fencing. How do you energize through gates? Do you trench underneath or what's the best way? Um, well, I never recommend running it through the actual gate. I'm a big fan of having the gate dead once it's down the ground. Um, my favorite way is to run like a, a tube underneath the ground, then feed a wire through that and go underneath the ground. Now that can be problematic because if that, if that uh, coated wire breaks or if you run equipment over the top of it and break that, there are problems with that. But in general, I prefer that over going overhead because you just equipment sizes, things to hook on, it's just problematic. I'm a big fan of really spending some time thinking about how to lay that fence out so you need as little underground fence as possible. Great. Another question. Uh, other than the kids, what kind of what brands of fence testers uh, to find shorts uh, are good to use? Well, every fencing energizer now, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but all the big brands have come out with their own energizers that work with their fencers. So I would say just be consistent with the brand you've got. Gallagher, Ken Cove, Speed Right, they've all got them. Just buy the fencer and the charger, or the tester that goes with that particular uh, energizer. The other cool thing about that is a lot of them now you can shut that fence off in the field. So once you find the short, you can use the remote to send the signal back, shut the fence off, fix it, turn it back on. It's great. It really is. Love technology. <clears throat> great. A uh, couple questions on grasses. I uh, probably hold off on those. So go ahead for a little bit here. Yep. And we have about 15 minutes left. All right. 15 minutes till two. Correct. Okay. All right, so recommendations from a grazer. This is my quote. Make an animal's first experience with an electric, with an electric fence a memorable one. Mine was. I'll leave it to your imagination, but I'm throwing myself under the bus with this. Let's just say I saw a dog marking his territory when I was really young. There it is. I respect electric fence to this day. Now that being said, I, I jokingly tell every new grazer that they should go and make sure these animals are fence trained before they put them out there. I worked with one guy one time, when he first put his cows out, he built a fence around 40 acres. He turned all the cows out and I'm not kidding you, he said he went to the bar and he spent the whole day drinking. He didn't wanna see what would happen. This is true. That might be a bit extreme, but the reality is you could take that beer drinking to another level where just go buy the case of beer and run a, a hot or a poly wire through a gate and hang 10, 12 cans off of that uh, temporary fence, right? And it could be soda, I'm just whatever you want. It's something to draw their attention. 
and shut the entire rest of your fence off. So that way you got full voltage and full current on that fence. And I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but I absolutely mean that that is a mental shock that they will remember. They instantly understand what a fence is because they're going to go up, they're going to see that beer can or that soda can, or whatever you put in there, they're going to get a shock, right? That's a real shock. It makes an impression and that will save you and them a lot of headache down the road. There's a lot of different ways to do that, but that is definitely one that is proven. So just keep that in mind. And I don't say that to be me. I'm not into like, it's just about this is the mental boundary and this is how we're going to teach them to use it. And then where's the first place I look when people are having trouble with the fence? The ground system. We talked a little bit about this, but the ground system is really the weak point that I see most of the time. And people just build them wrong. They don't use enough ground rods. They don't understand that these systems need to stay moist. Um, that you, if you, you really need to have enough ground field so that way when summer's at its driest and winter's at its coldest, that that's able to complete that circuit. The way a fence works is that charge goes out there, but you don't get a shock unless you're able to complete that circuit back to the ground rod. Think of that ground rod as a catcher's mitt. Now, if it's really small, the ability for that to bring that current back in and complete that circuit is limited. But if you've got that field spread out, you keep it moist so that way it can actually work, you're going to have a much better result. And the other thing too is be aware of straight voltage with ground systems and fence systems. Um, done a lot of this, I've got a real, I'm very aware of straight voltage because it's just about putting my family's farm out of business. It was a real, it's real in my world. Um, there's a lot of situations that I've seen where it's just not even an issue. So I'm not going to say that I pretend to be a straight voltage guy. I would absolutely consider some of these things, but I don't run electric fences up to metal buildings anymore. I put a 10 foot gate there. I don't run electric fences along metal buildings anymore. I, if you got to have it there, put a temporary fence there. If uh, I've got a ground field, I don't put it on the other side of the building and then have that ground charge pull the electric current underneath the barn. Have I seen this work and have I seen it in situations that haven't caused straight, caused straight voltage? I've seen it where it hasn't been a problem. But I've also seen situations where, personally, where every time the fencer clicked, the cows jumped until we figured out that the ground field was in the wrong spot. So just be aware of that. I'm not, I'm not saying this to scare people from fencing. I'm not saying to scare from a ground system, but I think that this is one of those things that people don't give enough credit to with a grazing system. Quick questions on that. Uh, what are your recommendations for depth of ground rod and how many to use for length of fence? We, for our NRCS standard, require three feet of ground rod per joule of fence. And we require one joule of fence per mile of electric wire on the surface. You've got five miles of fence, we would require a five joule fence. And that's right. Now I'm questioning myself. It's three feet per joule of fence is what we require for NRCS. Now I've talked to some of the fencing contractors and the energizer um, distributors, and they say that's probably an overkill. I don't know enough about it to say one or the other, so I'm going to stick with NRCS standards. If you're going with, uh, if you're not taking your cost share, I would still absolutely recommend putting in the amount of footage that the ground or the uh, contractor recommends and don't skimp on it. Okay, um, and then another one on fencing for electric high tensile. How many feet between fence posts for perimeter fence? Um, depends if you're taking your cost share or not. So if you're taking our cost share, uh, no more than 30 feet for perimeter. And if you're not taking our cost share, put it like you want. So one thing that we did, or I had when I was growing up is we probably had 75 plus feet between fence posts at my parents' place. And you could actually take a tractor and drive right over a single strand high tensile fence, which is a really nice thing to be able to do because we just used the, the small fiberglass uh, fence post. It flex down, flex back up. You know, you didn't have to worry about gates. Didn't, equipment size didn't matter. But for NRCS program purposes, we want to see 30 foot spacings on the perimeter and on the interior, 30 to 50, depending on how steep it is. Okay. Question about pigs. With pigs in their small feet, they tend to not ground the charge well. 
Does it work to do multi-strand with one hot, one ground wire, one hot, so they're more likely to ground themselves on the wire? Absolutely. And that's also the same thing I recommend for all winter in the winter time. If you've got a situation where the snow is insulating cattle and they've lost respect for the polywire, you run a ground underneath. The only thing you have to be aware of with that is it, there's a huge potential for a dead short. So use with caution, but it absolutely works. Okay. And another uh, electrical question. Uh, could you talk about what stray voltage is? Stray voltage is voltage, it doesn't have a home. Um, you know, it's basically a shock that's running down the electrical or the iron uh, channels in your barn. So if you've got a barn that's a tie stall barn and you've got basically some, some way that that electricity is getting from a power source onto that and the cows are either getting a, a shock or a bolt or they're getting a low consistent bolt on that. And that stress, that consistent stress on animals will kill them. Cows are very susceptible to that. All animals are susceptible to that. But that over the course of a long period of time will stress them out. You'll lose production, you'll lose animals, and it can be, it can wreak havoc on a farm. So like I said, don't be scared of it, but don't underestimate it. Go into this stuff with a little bit of education and you can have a nice system that will work quite well. Okay, looks like that's it for fencing questions for now. So we'll keep moving along. It looks like we've got about seven minutes left. I do have a couple of questions about cool season grasses and warm season grasses whenever you're ready for those. We'll see how far we get here. Lightning arrester, I'll just skip past this because that's just part of a good fencing. Don't underestimate it, but get something for lightning protection because I say this true. It's not if you're gonna get hit, it's when you're gonna get hit. Every fence out there will get hit at some point in time. So make sure you've got a surge protector between your uh, power source and your energizer. Make sure you've got a diverter or a choke or some sort of protection from the fence back to the energizer. Protect that energizer from both sides. Watering systems. All right, so this is a big one, all right? Water system, backbone of grazing. Um, you cannot underestimate how important this is for a rotational grazing system. So a lot of people want to, you know, if you're milking, you can come back, they can tank up, but there's a lot of research that shows that they don't need water out in the, out in the field. But if you've got beef or heifers or stockers, if you're bringing them back, not only are you walking them and burning calories, but you're probably setting them up for a situation that's hard not to overgraze some of these sites. So I'm a big fan of getting the water out there and setting it up so it's efficient for grazing and also for water. Um, water is a factor in production and don't underestimate that. And the other thing too with Wisconsin water, you know, there's just a lot of research out there that shows that clean water is going to limit the amount of parasites that they'll take up. So a lot of times people ask me, well, I've got a pond there, why don't I drink that? Or why can't I let the cows down there? Well, if you put them in the pond or put them out there, they are, there's a much larger potential for different parasites or liver flukes and all these have an impact on that cattle's ability put on milk, meat, and bowl. So I'm a huge fan of clean water and I'm a huge fan of clean water also because you can utilize a water tank to strategically rotate that around and move nutrients. So I come back to those small details that are easy to do that if you just think about where you wanna go with this, you've got an opportunity to really impact your farm over the course of the next summer and over the course of the next decade. I can't stress that enough. The farms that do that are really something to see the production, the management, everything about them is really stellar. So temporary source. So this is probably more common when we use frequent. Um, it allows you to move. When we put the pipelines out there, we'll put couplers every 100 to 300 feet, depending on the size you heard. And then you can put a temporary uh, tank with holes in there and you can move it around. I'm a big fan of these bottom mounted floats because the likelihood of an animal knocking that off is much less. Can things mess with them? Yes. Biggest issue I've had with these temporary ball floats are on animals with horns. They'll take their horns in the tank and you know, they got that little like, scrape at the bottom. I don't know why they do it. And bulls with smaller tanks can be a problem too. So if you've got those issues, you might wanna to move to a bigger tank. The other thing with these temporary tanks, especially with new pipeline systems, people always are telling me that their water's too hot. It really becomes a first year issue. And the reality is, is that that water can get pretty hot from one till three in the afternoon. The other reality is, is that grass, even on a hot day in summer is more than 70% water. So the likelihood of those cattle not having enough water is slim. The other thing is, 
that that water cools down quite quickly after five and it was probably really really kind of nice all the way up until noon that day so there's only a small gap if they don't have water if it's so hot that they won't drink if that's still a problem move to a lighter color tank or put an overflow on that so we can kind of bleed off water during the hot part of the summer <clears throat> all right permanent tanks i'm not a huge fan of permanent tanks but they have their place and where i think they have their place on are for uh, operations that don't see as much management the big reason being is that grass we can size that easy but these temporary tanks where we're going to be away from the site, we've got an offsite job, or we're only able to check them every couple of days. It just ensures quantity of water. So that way you've got the peace of mind that the cattle have water. Now, that being said, site placement is extremely important. Choose these sites so they're not down in the sweat. Think about this. It sounds simple and silly when we say this, but I've seen it too many times. Don't put the tank where the water flows. Because if you put the big tank where you're going to water these animals in what we call a concentrated flow path, which is a bee where water runs, what are you going to have when it rains? A muddy mess. Now, if you take that tank and put it on the top of the hill, you've used the landscape towards your advantage. You've kept the manure, you've kept the nutrients there so the grass can benefit from that. And don't create a resource concern with nutrients running off the place. Very simple, um, but this comes back to good planning and good grazing plan from the get-go. Winter watering systems. Awesome, can't talk enough about them. I am a huge fan of out wintering for beef operations in the state of Wisconsin. If you wanna do that, you've gotta have a good winter water. Think about the placement of these as well. Don't think that they gotta be right by your building. I've already put 6,000 plus feet of these pipelines out. So they're out, you know, we're talking over a mile in different directions, buried pipeline for these. So that way we can move nutrients around and manure around and allow for someone to easily and adequately feed their animals over the winter time. These are permanent. They're not inexpensive, but they're they're really a benefit. And I say everybody should consider them, whether they've got dairy heifers or a beef cow calf operation or anything like that, you should really consider all work because it is so much to your advantage. I cannot stress enough how underutilized I think that is. Now that being said, don't outwinter next to the trout stream. Don't outwinter on super wet hydric soils that the cows are gonna be belly deep on. There are things to consider with that. So please, please take a look at what you've got so you don't inadvertently cause yourself problems that you spent a bunch of money to get out there. Tank size, if you're working with us, we'll get it. The reality is uh, most tanks I'm dealing with, uh, if you've got a 20 cow herd, you have 50 gallons. If you got over a 20 cow herd, 100 to 150 gallons. Um, it can be smaller. I, my parents' place, we uh, use a, a blue 55-gallon drum that's come to thirds, and that waters all the animals all day long. But we've got enough water and enough quantity of it that when they drink, it's there. So it comes down to how much water you can get there. So there's some factors with it. Don't underestimate that. If you're going to skimp or if you're concerned about it, go a little bit bigger. <clears throat> we've hit our 2 o'clock mark. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Oh, this is something that will, I got to get through this because this is, these are just pipeline stuff. I want to show this to people, talk about lanes from a dairy standpoint, but the most important thing we didn't even get to, and this is it right here. I got to take five minutes. I'm sorry. Understanding this grass growth curve for rest and residual is what's going to make you productive. It's going to make you profitable. It's going to make you a good grazer. And this is why we offer caution for this. So if you take nothing else away from this conversation, understand that grasses need rest and that they grow exponentially as fast if you leave six inches there. And the difference between taking it down to three inches versus six inches is probably a 20 or 30% loss in yield over the course of the summer. That is a great, great Thing to, to end on there. So thanks so much for everything, Adam. I wish we had a whole nother hour to watch all of this because it looks like you had a lot of information to give us. So thank you everybody for joining us um, and for all the great questions. I apologize for a couple that we didn't get to, um, but uh, I'm sure Adam would be more than happy to answer any questions if you reach out to him. Do you have contact information you can share with us, Adam? Uh, you can reach out to me on my cell phone, which is 715-467-1037, or you can send me an email at adam.able at usda.gov.
All right, great. On the website too. So. Yes, so Google him, Adam Abel, A-B-E-L. Um, it should be in all your agenda and everything like that as well. So again, thank you so much for everything, Adam. Um, if you want to hold on, we'll go ahead and get the, the sponsor or the last slide up. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. <clears throat>